Thanks for taking the time to listen to our latest content here on the Blood Red channel. Guy here with just a quick message. Do you want the very latest Liverpool FC news directly into your inbox? Well then sign up to our daily LFC newsletter, which will bring you the breaking news and big events from around Anfield. To subscribe, just go to bit.ly forward slash LFC newsletter. That's B-I-T dot L-Y forward slash LFC newsletter. Or click the link in the description of this podcast and pop in your email address. It really is that simple. That link once more bit.ly forward slash LFC newsletter. Well, thanks for your time and on with the podcast. This is the Blood Red podcast from the Liverpool Echo. Project restart, well, perhaps it's time for a rethink for the Premier League as the opinion to their planned proposals don't seem to be going down all too well. Games behind closed doors on neutral venues would in fact stop Liverpool winning the league at Anfield. No matter what, I'm Guy Clark. This is the Blood Red Podcast here from the Liverpool Echo. As we get set to discuss Project Restart once more, we're also going to take a delve into what others have been saying about Liverpool's bid to secure that league title before getting in to some of those able Champions League nights at Anfield. With Sunday, of course, having marked 15 years since the win over Chelsea in 2005. Whilst this week, we also see the first anniversary of the 4-0 win over Barcelona. Joining me to do all of that and much more besides our chief LFC writer, Ian Doyle. Doyle, how are you? I'm OK, yourself. That's quite a sharp haircut you've got there. Yeah, thanks. Those obviously <laughs> listening into the, to the podcast won't see it, but I've joined... Ian Doyle and Dan Kay also with us. Dan, how are you? I have to say, I went out for a walk today and felt the uh, the wind sailing through, well, my hair. What What is left of it? <laughs> well, I'm not surprised. You're definitely looking a lot more aerodynamic now, Guy. And uh, I think you've, um, what, 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 once you've, uh, what, once you've taken the plunge, you, you'll find yourself, your life will improve in all manner of ways now. You, you, you mark my words. Well, we're going to get into talking about a goalkeeper very soon, but playing in goal for the Echo 11 aside team, I'm hoping that can fly through the air and turn a few more over the uh, top of the bar a lot easier. A man who doesn't have such problems is Matt Addison. Matt, how are you? Yeah, very good, thanks. I am uh, in need of a haircut or getting very close, but certainly won't be going that short, that is for certain. <laughs> you're not going to You're not going to look at Dan K, Doyley and myself as inspiration then. Steer clear of it. Anyway, let's get into things straight from the off then. And some, some fairly big news coming out this afternoon, Doily, regarding Loris Karius. Of course, he hasn't played for Liverpool for over two years in competitive action now, but it looks as though his stay in Turkey has come to an end. Yeah, he's been he's been kind of hinting at this for a while, hasn't he? He's, he's had issues of some sort. It seems to be a lot of the time when he's been at Besiktas. In terms of his actual playing time he's played almost every single game that he's been available for he's, he's hardly missed a game in those two years but there was a story last year about maybe 12 months ago i think it was where there was some suggestion that he wasn't getting paid and so he went to fifa and he, he got paid in the end and the same thing happened uh, a couple of weeks ago and at the time it was kind of claimed that he was going to terminate his contract that's what the sick tests were claiming and his agent came out but uh, carries his agent came out and said well that's not exactly the case but it turns out that you know it actually was, and he, he wants to end his time there. I think um, I think in Turkey, the Sigtas in particular, they've had some problems with all of their players over the last couple of years in terms of payment on time. I and mean, they do get paid. It's just that sometimes it's two or three or four months afterwards, and so the Karis bit unhappy with that. I think he was a little bit unhappy with perhaps some of the treatment that not so much he got from the club, but you know from the media over there or whatever. There was a mistake. It seemed to be his fault and given what happened to him towards the end of his time, certainly when he last played for Liverpool, we, we know what happened there and his reaction to that. It, it, you know, it wasn't great what happened to him, but you know, for him to come you know, come out and say, look, he's terminating it, he's just suggested that enough. Obviously, the, the situation that's ongoing indicates perhaps he wouldn't have been going back and playing there anyway um, once his loan deal was up. So now Liverpool have got a, a player who I think for a while now they've known that he, he wasn't going to be going back on to Besiktas, the, you know, the the club were Turkish club were obligated to to sign him when they signed that two year loan deal, and now obviously they're not pay, taking up that option. And whether or not that leads to some kind of dispute, I don't know. That's something a bit further down the line, but certainly he's not going to be playing for Besiktas again. And let's be honest, I don't think he's going to be playing for Liverpool again either. So it's going to be a matter of Loris Carrius finding a new club for himself whenever the transfer window opens. Whether that's a loan because he's still got another two years left on uh, his Liverpool contract. 
yeah, Dan, I know he's a player, of course, whilst he's been away from Liverpool, the Echo often sort of trying to keep a track of how he's getting on. And I know yourself, you're a man who does keep an eye on how Carius has been getting on in Turkey. And as Doyle says, it hasn't been, for want for a better phrase, without the pun, a Turkish delight for him. No, no, it certainly hasn't. He, um, he had a little bit of a, a, a tortuous start there, a couple of high-profile mistakes in games. Seems to kind of find his feet a little bit. And, you know, we read a couple of more kind of positive reports coming out uh, of Turkey as, as to how he was getting on there. But um, it, it's it, it's not it's not gone the way that he or, or the club or, or, or the Shiktas themselves would have wanted. Um, as Doyle said, I think Liverpool will probably have been aware for some time that he was unlikely to, to be there next season. And so... You know, Doyle used the expression it will be a case of Carius you're trying to find a, a new club for himself. Well, it, it's it's probably a, a bit of both, really. Carius's people and representatives will be involved with that. But I'm sure Liverpool will have their irons in the fire and looking to find a, some kind of method how they can enable him to, to you know, have a, the next stage of his career. Because, you know, I don't think there's any... It's, it's not being mean or unkind to say that nobody, none of us are particularly wanting to see him in a Liverpool shirt again. And I think, you know, that that door is closed now. But, you know, I, I certainly don't wish the lad ill. You know, obviously what happened in Kiev was a nightmare for him, a nightmare for all of us there. But, you know, he, he played his he played his part in getting Liverpool to the final to a certain degree. <clears throat> and, um, you know, I think we often like to look at ourselves as supporters. You know, we don't, unless there's a very good reason, we don't really like to kind of beat up on former players. So... I hope the lad can get himself sorted out and, and, and get a new club for himself and go on and have a decent career, but it won't be at Anfield. No, you say it won't say. be as you say, you say it won't be at Anfield and stuff. One of the, the things that's often overlooked was the fact that of course that start of the, the twenty eighteen nineteen season, last season that he did actually against West Ham, sit on the bench for the first game. Of course, just wonder if obviously with Simon Mignole having gone two years down the line, if there is any opportunity at all for Carriers to come back in, even if that were just as a backup goalkeeper? Yeah, it's an interesting one. I wouldn't rule it out 100%, but I think it is quite unlikely that we ever see him in a Liverpool shirt again. I think if he was going to come back and, and play for Liverpool again, I think this two-year spell in Turkey would have had to have gone without a hitch, really. I think it would have had to have gone well in terms of obviously on the field without some of the high-profile mistakes that we've seen him make, but also off the pitch as well. Obviously, this is just the, the latest disagreement, as Doyle outlined. There's been a few different reports coming back that you know maybe it's not gone quite so smoothly. So I think for him to have sort of reconciled with, with Liverpool and been able to come back into the fold, I think it would have it would have needed to go much more smoothly than, than what it has done. I think the most likely scenario is that he does now move on um, in the summer and, and go somewhere else. It's going to be interesting to see where that is, though, because you know we, we've seen Wolves and, and one or two other Premier League clubs potentially you know, rumoured to be interested in him. Um, how much truth there is in that, I don't know. Um, but then it's a case of would he go there and be the number two goalkeeper or, or does he want to go and, and be a number one? So, you know, with the, the coronavirus outbreak, the transfer market is going to be really, really strange this summer. It's not the ideal time to be trying to find yourself a club at all. Um, but yeah, it's going to be interesting to, to see what he can do. And I'm sure that there will be teams out there who take a look at him. Obviously, we know what's happened, but you know, the, there's a reason that Liverpool signed him. And you know, somewhere deep down, there is a decent goalkeeper there. So I'm sure there will be someone who will take a gamble. Is he a player as well, Doyley, that perhaps Liverpool, having done so much right in the, the transfer window, even when it comes to offloading players that they clearly don't want at the club? We, we've seen over the last few years, of course, Danny Ings had that loan move with the obligation to Southampton. Obi Ajari has got one with Reading. This was meant to be the same for Carrius going out to Turkey, but it hasn't played out. Is it now one of those where all of the good work that Michael Edwards does do, that actually Liverpool might have to accept that they make a loss on Carrius and just baptise and, and move on? Well, don't forget, they paid next to nothing for him in the first place. I think it was, was it five million or something like that? It could yeah. have even been less. Um, and when you bear in mind that Alisson cost 65 million, is Alisson 60 million better than Carrius? Well, he probably is. He's probably, you know, quite a few million better than every other goalkeeper in the world, except for possibly one. So, in that respect, I don't think Liverpool will mind too much taking a hit. But I think it's, as Matt said, it's about looking after the player as well. You know, he's, he's, 
you know, Klopp stood by him initially after what happened in uh, in Kiev, but it became obvious pretty quickly the following the pre-season that things weren't quite right. And not, not all the fans, but there were one or two who could never, ever forgive him. And in terms of him coming back and playing for Liverpool, can you imagine if, like, he is on the bench, then Alisson gets injured and then he comes on and everyone must be waiting for the mistake. And I know that sounds terrible because all goalkeepers make mistakes, but... Not all goalkeepers make mistakes like the two he made in the Champions League, well, certainly one of them in the Champions League final. And then it's with everything else that happened as well, which was unfortunate. It wasn't really his fault about the, you know, the stuff about the concussion. I don't think he ever wanted that to come out, but it did. And you know, he, had, he had to explain it. You know, it, it, it was a medical fact, but at the time it just made him look a little bit, not making excuses, but he was trying to come up with reasons. And I think I think the other thing with Karras, you forget at the time, is that there were still loads of people who couldn't quite grasp, but I must admit, I'm one of them, why Mignolet was jettisoned from the team at the time, because he was actually playing quite well, and that season, the pair of them were competing at one time, I think Carriers was the Champions League goal, oh, Mignolet was the Champions League goalkeeper, and then it was Carriers, and then it all got very confusing, and I think, um, you know, Klopp bought in Carriers, he stood by him, played him, you know, they got to the final, as, as you know, as, as has been said, but you know, I don't think he's going to be coming back to Liverpool to play a game, to just be coming back to Liverpool to train and then possibly get sold. Well, let's move on then from Loris Carrius. That's the, the latest on him. If you do want more, head to the Liverpool Echo website. Of course, Paul Gorse has written in full all of what has come out from Loris Carrius. But let's get into Project Restart then, Dan. We spoke about it at length on Friday's episode of the podcast. And yourself... Me and Matt, we were sort of beginning to think after the Premier League statement that came out on Friday, there wasn't much to it, that opinion might be changing a bit to actually how eager everyone is to get football back straight away. And the Premier League seemed to be doing some sort of dithering around it. And that does kind of seem to have been some of the feeling during the course of the weekend, a number of people coming out and just wanting to know exactly how this is going to play out because nothing concrete is, is really getting sorted. No, the you know the the detail at the moment is still kind of fairly sketchy, isn't it? And you, we're kind of relying on little snippets that you know kind of come out in various articles that 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 uh, that do the rounds. It seems like kind of the impression you get at the moment is like one of the major bones of contention is the issue about neutral venues. In fact, there was a piece of Martin Ziegler in the Times that which was which we turned around this morning that basically suggested that um, the issue has led to significant divisions. Uh, amongst the 20 teams, with possibly as many as eight clubs being opposed to it. Uh, and as we know, for for um, anything to be kind of taken on board, 14 out of the 20 clubs must be in agreement. So, you know, I don't, you know, 14 is, is what? Pretty much three quarters of a percentage. Um, it, it's, I don't think you're ever going to get a, un- a unanimous verdict on this. Uh, yeah, there are also some suggestions floating around that some will comply if relegation is abandoned, which you know seems seems a rather strange way of looking at it. The reality is there is there is no perfect situation. Everybody is going to have to compromise. Everybody is going to have to give ground on this to a certain degree. Um, it, it is literally impossible to come up with a solution that every party is going to find acceptable. Um, so, I think it's going to. I think the whole thing is going to rumble on for some time. Yet to come, you know, we, we know there's another another meeting on um, Friday, uh, and, and we're expecting a, a, a bit more clarification from the government, aren't we, this week in terms of like the next stage of lockdown and 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 what, whatever restrictions may or may not be eased. So I guess things may become slightly clearer towards the end of the week, but for now, it's it's as clear as mud, I'm afraid. That's the thing, isn't it, Matt? The one thing that does seem to sort of be agreed on universally now across the divisions and across English football, like to Hugo Lloris has come out and said something, as has a former Crystal Palace owner, Simon Jordan. We'll get on to the current one, Steve Parrish, shortly. But a lot of people now basically saying no matter what happens, the Premier League title just has to end up with Liverpool because they've done so much to deserve it already. Yeah, absolutely. Obviously, when you look at the number of points that Liverpool have accumulated, it's the only sensible option, isn't it? That that Liverpool do end up, you know, as winners of this Premier League title. But as much as it's a shame that that 30-year wait would come to an end in that sort of a way, it sort of seems like that's the way it's going. And I think Hugo Lloris makes the point that, you know, it, it would be a massive shame if 
it was decided in the same way that it's been done in France, whereby it's done on a points per game system rather than those matches, you know, even if they do have to be behind closed doors, rather than just getting them done and getting through it. So I think certainly, you know, we, we spoke about Sergio Aguero's comments on Friday and there's a couple more players, Loris included, who've sort of put their head above the parapet, if you like, and, and came out and said, this is, you know, the best option or, or that's the best option. And yeah, I think as we're going to touch on shortly with, you know, obviously what Steve Parrish has said, I think we have to listen to what the players are thinking uh, and consider their thoughts on the matter because it's not just about clubs and it's not just about fans. The whole thing falls down if they're not comfortable with it as well. So yeah, it's another sort of layer to consider. It's another factor that has to be put into the equation of, of when do we come back and how do we do that. But yeah, certainly you've got to agree with what Hugo Lloris has said that this season in an ideal world wouldn't be ending the way it has done. But unfortunately, it does look like that's going to be the case. And Dolly, I know you've written a piece on the site regarding obviously the 30-year wait for the title. And we've, been, we've known for some time obviously, with what's going on that things would have to get concluded behind closed doors. But this neutral venue idea really does seem to be getting pushed more and more all the time now, as Dan said. And I suppose for Liverpool, it would have been an empty stadium. It would have been nice to secure the title at Anfield, but that obviously doesn't look like it's going to be possible. Sure, I think just for Liverpool now and the rest of the club, it's a matter of just getting the job done, whether that is on the pitch or in the boardroom with decisions. I mean, as, as, as Dan said, it's got completely reliant on the government and what they say. We forget what football is saying. The reason there's no concrete suggestions and plans is because they're all kind of, they don't have to. That's why they, they don't have to make any plans because they don't know what's going on yet. So they're just contemplating and considering everything. And I would imagine that maybe neutral grounds will be used and the clubs will eventually come round because if the option is, all right, well, you don't have to play at the neutral ground, you just don't play. That means you don't get your broadcast money and that, that means you might miss out on this, that and the other and you forfeit the game. And that's not forcing people to play games, but at the start of the season, they would have had to, they would have known they've had to have, you know, played all of their games and uh, done the fixture list. So I don't really see, I can see with the likes of Brighton moaning saying, or not moaning, but pointing out saying that we've got to play Arsenal, Liverpool, I think it's United, Chelsea, City, or most of them teams anyway, at home. And that would have given us an advantage because we played them away from home. And so our advantage is playing at home. That's been taken away from us. But it's the same for every other team. Well, surely it would be easy for them then to play away from home against other teams that they're playing because then they haven't got their home crowd. So it kind of evens itself out a little bit along the way. But, I mean... What what slightly as and you may have picked up you may have mentioned this on Friday. Um, what's annoyed me is that people getting annoyed at football, trying to make these plans for restarting. Because what do they expect? Forget football for a minute. Just say it's any industry. What do they expect people to do? Just sit around and then at the last minute when everyone says okay, you can go now, then they'll be like, well, we can't do anything yet because we haven't decided this, that, and the other. Imagine if you know you're working in a in a restaurant which has been closed then it gets told it can open and then all the all the people who work there are going right okay let, let's go and they just get told well, we can't do anything because we haven't got any stock and we haven't we haven't drawn up this we haven't drawn up any rotors we haven't got all these supplies and it's going to be another four or five weeks before we sort it out they'd be absolutely fuming because that's another four or five weeks where they've not got paid so it's just it'd be a dereliction of duty for any sport and don't forget that the government have set up this working group for all elite sports not football you know cricket rugby golf all of those to see when they can restart safely no one's saying do it now no, no one's come out and said yeah let's start football when it's unsafe no one's saying that they're saying when the government who are led by the science that's what they tell us that, that they say right we can you can go for it then they can start looking and go right we're going to make concrete these plans and that's when the real debate should be happening then because there'll still be another four five possible weeks before they even kick a ball anyway so there's loads more time for us to argue about everything can't wait <laughs> yeah, no, it, it hits the nail on the head, though, Matt, on a, on a point you did make on Friday in terms of why we're getting dates put on everything all the time because we don't know when it's going to be safe. But these plans do need to start to be to be formulated. But regarding then Project Restart and just how important actually it is, not just for the Premier League to get going, but you sort of mentioned there Steve Parrish beforehand. He, he came out and spoke quite openly, actually. It was refreshing as well to see over the weekend what he had to say regarding the importance actually on Premier League football getting back underway and actually the knock-on effect that could have for the rest of sort of the English football pyramid, which in many ways is unique. 
Yeah, I think it was certainly one of the more sensible approaches to this. And I think it was a, a sort of well thought out and, and well reasoned piece that he put together, I think, for the the, the Sunday Times. I think I'm right in saying that. And um, yeah, it, he does sort of admit a few things. Obviously, um, every Premier League club has their own self-interest. That, that goes without saying. That's something we've discussed. And the other thing is, of course, that, you know, every Premier League club is heavily invested in terms of the money as well. Because, you know, as, as we know, if the season doesn't get played, then I think it's something like 750, 800 million pounds that between them they would lose out on. So he starts by saying, you know, it's not an ideal situation. There are certain things that are not in the best possible way going to happen. It, it's simply a fact that it's not going to be a perfect finish to this Premier League season. But as you say, he says it's vitally important, not just the Premier League, but for, for clubs lower down to, to finish. You know, in terms of the barriers, there's lots of things that have to take place to make it safe. But he says that Crystal Palace and the rest of the Premier League clubs are committed to, to making sure that is the case. And one of the, the nice lines that I've picked out really is he's, he calls football magnificently meaningless, meaning that, OK, it's not life and death. It's not, you know, as important as the NHS and that sort of thing. But at the same time, football can come back. It wouldn't necessarily be a bad thing. It wouldn't take away from the seriousness of the situation. It would just perhaps help with the mental health aspect. It would give something uh, to talk about, you know, obviously not just for us, but for the wider public as well. It would give something to take people's minds off what has been undoubtedly a, a difficult few weeks. So, well, he, he says, as we mentioned, to, to listen to the players, he says that it's got to be done in a safe way. But I th the sort of comments that he's made probably are similarly sort of thought out at, at other clubs as well. And, and certainly, obviously, Liverpool have their own interest of, of getting the Premier League title finished. But, you know, this is, I think, a sensible admission of there are difficulties, but equally, there is a way to make it happen. And we do have to make that happen. Yeah, we do want to see football returning down, and obviously with that, and in terms of the, the broadcast revenue that Steve Parrish talks about, would be Sky Sports and their footage obviously carrying a lot of Premier League games, and there's one of their senior pundits, of course, Gary Neville, always a uh, favourite with Liverpool supporters, has come out and, and said, whether it be a, a t-shirt or a, a badge on a suit or whatever, that he's going to wear an asterisk, which I suppose just continues... Well, the relationship, the special relationship, should we say, that Gary Neville has with Liverpool supporters? Yeah, I mean, it, I have to say, you know, I, I when Gary Neville was playing for Manchester United, I had a similar view of him as I think a lot of Liverpool supporters did. But um, I think he's been an absolute breath of fresh air since he's gone into punditry. He's raised Sky standards absolutely through the roof, obviously along with our own Jamie Carragher. And I think in general, he talks an awful lot of sense, whether it's about football, whether it's about politics. Um, you know, long before we, coronavirus was on the agenda, there was a, you know, there was an incident in the Tottenham Chelsea game over, um, just before Christmas regarding racism. And I thought he spoke very, very, very well on that. Um, I've, I've got a lot of time for Gary Neville as, you know, as, a, as a human being, if not necessarily as a former Manchester United player. One thing I would say is, well, I've actually noticed over social media in really the last few days, really, some Liverpool fans are actually trying to kind of take ownership of the asterisk a little bit. So, listen, Gary Neville and others will make their own entertainment as and where they may, uh, as and when Liverpool do get this league. And it will be only really to kind of assuage their own agony at seeing that the team they dislike being crowned top of the tree. So, I don't, it, it certainly won't bother me what Gary, what t shirts him or any of his ilk wear. And I would imagine that most Liverpool supporters would feel the same way about it. A bit of banter at the end of the day, isn't it? No, and exactly. I'd, I'd, argue, I'd argue that actually the asterisk makes it even better. And for one mm. very simple reason, that there are nine games to go. Nine games, that's 27 points that, that teams can win. I think City can still win 30, can't they? Because they've got 10 games. And if they just called it off now and said, Liverpool champions, absolutely everybody, there wouldn't be anybody really, realistically, that you can argue with that oh, Liverpool weren't going to win the league. And nine games to go. That is, it's absolutely, you know. So it's like, here's the Liverpool team that won the, that won the league fairly with with a quarter of the season still left. So yeah, I mean, you could make an argument that in a weird way, no matter how it gets finished, this could be Liverpool's most memorable ever championship win with 
the amount of wins they've got and then the way that, you know, the weight that's just gone on for even longer. I think it was last week that they it went past the whole, the, the actual 30 years that the anniversary, yeah. passed, which no one, certainly not in February, was expecting to reach that stage. But I think, I think it, the Liverpool fans that, as Dan said, are trying to take ownership of it, it's a positive, they should do, because how many Manchester United titles have a little asterisk next to them? How many Arsenal won? How many Chelsea? You know, there'll be Liverpool won because they'll have won the league in a season that didn't even get finished. And nobody argued with the fact that they, that they deserved to win it. And of course, if it does get finished, then fine, then they'll have just won it properly. Yes, I suppose I hadn't thought of it in, in that manner, Doyle, but it, it does just show actually. And also, I suppose just the talk of so many people from within the game, even rivals and, and the such like Antonio Rudiger, one of those who's basically just said hand the title to Liverpool, still nine games to go. It, it is mind-boggling, but I suppose it comes back to that phrase, Matt. What was it Steve Parrish had said magnificently meaningless? It, it's one of those light-hearted things within football. Even within a situation like this, we can find some light-heartedness. Yeah, exactly. I think, obviously, it look, the only sensible solution, and, and I think, to be fair to Gary Neville, I think he did actually say, you know, that there is no other option than for Liverpool to win it. And he was, you know, very, very complimentary towards Liverpool as well as, as that line at the end. But, yeah, um, as you say, look, Liverpool have, have been by far and away the best team in this league this year. And if, ultimately, Jordan Henderson lifts the Premier League trophy without any supporters there, then, you know, that will just give this Liverpool team and, and the supporters as well a little bit more determination to win the thing next year as well, hopefully by which time fans will be back in at Anfield and, and various stadiums around the country. So, look, I, I don't think it's something to be concerned about. Even if it was, there's nothing that anybody can do about it. And if it means that Liverpool fans are, are still desperate to win the title next year, then so be it. I think this team is certainly capable of doing that. Well, Doyley said before about the, the 30th anniversary of Liverpool's last league title coming up. This week marks uh, a few, well, this yesterday and, and this week obviously mark a few poignant anniversaries for Liverpool in Europe. So last 10 minutes or so here on this edition of the Blood Red podcast, we're going to get into some of those fabled Anfield nights. And Dan, we did a podcast that went out yesterday, the road to Istanbul that we've been doing throughout the season. Doyley says the asterisk season will make things even sweeter. As you said on the pod yesterday, Luis Garcia's goal against Chelsea in 2005, the fact that it's debated whether the ball went over the line or not, in many ways makes that even sweeter and even better. Well, absolutely, because it is kind of, it, it's one of those what-if moments that will that will have football fans, and particularly Chelsea and Liverpool fans, arguing until the end of time. The fact that it was before the era of goal line technology and VAR and all this business means that it's one of those indefinables that Chelsea fans can argue till the cows come home as much as they like about this, that and the other. But it's there in the record book for Lewis Garcia, four minutes. And speaking personally, and there were a fair few Liverpool fans who feel the same, it just adds to the whole sheen of, of, of that particular situation. It was an incredible night and you know, Liverpool have been very spoiled by them. Um, you know, later this week, we've, we've got the anniversary of the Barcelona game, which I think for me personally just has to just slightly take top spot. Not necessarily even because um, you know, it was overcoming a three-goal deficit. The players that Liverpool were without that night through injury and then obviously deprived of Andy Robertson at half-time as well. For me, and I thought Ian Doyley summed this up very well in a piece that, that, that went online yesterday, or certainly over the weekend, regarding Liverpool's mentality giants kind of aura that they have about them. It was the fact that this incredible season that, that had been you know, such high quality and such consistency, it, it looked like that was the night it was going to end because Vincent Company had scored that great goal the night before, because uh, having played so well in the new Camp the week before, we got beat 3-0. It seemed like it was all going to end so unfairly in, in tears and heartbreak. And yet, the, and yet the team decided, no, we are not going to let it go down like this. We refuse to accept that this is the end. And that's why, for me, it, it's the context of the situation that, that to me, put, that makes that at the very top of the street. Just one more I'd add in as well. It's actually the... And even old, even old lags like me and Doyle are slightly too old for this. On this day in 1965 was Liverpool's first ever European Cup semi-final against Inter Milan which was uh, three or four days after they won the FA Cup for the first time at Wembley against Leeds. Uh, my dad, who was an Evertonian, he, he, he was there that night and they, they paraded the cup beforehand. Inter were the reigning European Cup champions and were about to host the final on their own ground, which I think we all know is one of the reasons why they got a helpful referee in the second leg. 
Um, but it was any you know any one of that era will tell you. you know, I'm sure Julie said uh, from his dad about it on numerous occasions. That was one of the seminal Anfield nights, and it should have been four one if Chris Lawler's great goal before half time hadn't been disallowed. No, uh, it's incredible, really, isn't it? Whether it be Champions League semi final tie story, or whether it be even rounds beforehand or whatever, it is that thing that you just can't explain with Anfield where when Liverpool go into a situation, even when you think, oh, there's no way they'll overcome this, it's just something that that happens. True. I mean, I just want to go back to the Chelsea game just for a second. I mean, at the time, I mean, that's allowed. That's still the loudest Anfield's ever been that I've been going. Yeah, it, it, It's certainly because there was the huge build-up to the game. In fact, the, the first time they were in the Champions League uh, semi-final for 20 years, and that the goal came so early as well. It just kind of built from that. And then, of course, Chelsea were quite clearly miles better than Liverpool, but they couldn't find a way to... I mean, they won the league by about a million points that season, didn't they? So 37, I think. Yeah, well, it was 37 ahead of Liverpool, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. And the thing about the Chelsea, if they had VAR or goal line technology, great. Sound, the goal might not be over the line. It's a penalty to Liverpool and Petr Cech gets sent off. And I think everyone forgets that. that if, if the referee pulls it back, which he could do, let it play on. Then checks off. It's a penalty because Barros got fouled. I think it was, and and then you know he's probably scoring the penalty, Gerard. And then suddenly Chelsea are still one 0 down, but they're down to ten men. So it's like, what can they do? So I actually think that the, you know that the decision, whether it was right or wrong, that helped Chelsea. And if Adiga Johnson wants to miss in the last minute, then that's up to him. So you know, to, to, to do, I, I saw that I saw that Liverpool's uh, the official website were rerunning the game. They were putting clips out in real time. And where we sat in the press in the press box, that I was sat next to Andy Hunter. Now he was at the Daily Post where I was at the time, and uh, he's obviously now at the Guardian. But we were right on line with that shot, and literally when he hit it, everyone was just thinking, "That's in," and and oh no, we're going to have to completely write all of our stuff. <laughs> so when he went, when he went wide, we were like, "Well, I was like, oh, phew. Uh, I'm not sure Andy was quite so keen on it going wide, but anyway, that's another story. Um, but. Uh, I think in terms of overall the performance, I think the game against Barcelona was probably Liverpool's best ever performance at Anfield ever, for, for everything that Dan said. The actual atmosphere at the beginning of the game was like people people just turning up and thinking, oh, well, yeah, we've got a chance, that we might have a chance. But they weren't like massively behind it like they were for the Chelsea game. But of course, mm-hmm. by the end, it was just, it was insane. And everybody was in hysterics. Yeah. And the, the weird thing is the goal that Juan Aldum scored, his second one, the third one, was celebrated more than the Trent one, be- uh, yeah. the uh, Trent corner, because some people didn't even see what had happened. Everyone was waiting for the corner to be taken or looked away. Like, I think Jürgen, I think Jürgen Klopp didn't see it, or no, Ben Woodburn, it was, he didn't see it on the bench. So there was even players involved who didn't see what had gone on. Another night that I'm sure Dan has heard many a tale about, uh, which my dad always said was the best one, was against San Etienne in 1977, which was the quarterfinal where Liverpool went into the game 1-0 down, got it down to, got it back to one all, then conceded at the start of the second half, which we needed two, and then they got two goals, and of course it, it put in legend super sub David Furclough getting one in at the cop end, and, and you look back, Liverpool had won zero European Cups at that point. Seven years later, they'd won four. So it's, you know, if, if there are moments that, you know, spark something or turn things around, that's one of them. And, you know, as Dan said about the Barcelona game, the other thing at the end of that, I don't think I've ever been so made up for a group of players that they'd actually yeah. got some kind of reward for what they'd done. Because it's yeah. looking back now, you realise that the actual title battle with Man City was just ridiculous. I mean, mm-hmm. OK, we know what points tally they got on. They both ended up on, was it 98 and 97? But it's the fact that every single game, if one would go first, we've won. The next one, we've won, we've won, we've won, we've won, we've won. And every single game you thought, oh, they can't possibly, oh, they've won again. They can't possibly, oh, they've won again. So when they lost in Barcelona, you were thinking, oh, hang on. And they've played really well that day as well. They've played really, really well. Probably one of the best performances in a European away game in which they could have easily won 3-0, let alone lost 3-0. Hmm. So, yeah, the Barcelona game is probably still, Barcelona would be the best performance, but I still think Chelsea fair atmosphere. Yeah, agreed. Well, this week on the Blood Red channel, we've got some special content, obviously, lined up for the uh, for Thursday, the, the first anniversary, the 4-0 win over Barcelona. And Matt, you've been speaking to a man who's witnessed all of the, these games that we, we've mentioned. And I, I mean, we could even be going back to Inter Milan and, well, certainly St Etienne, he, w- he would have been working there. Voice of Anfield, George Sefton, of course. And 
well, just looking back on so many of these matches, I mean, for him, it must be a privilege. And obviously, you, you've had a chance to, to speak with him all about it. Yeah, it was a really interesting chat. He's always got a fair few stories to tell. And it's interesting that, that both of you guys said that, you know, the, the 2005 atmosphere was, was better than the Barcelona one because he actually said the other way around, certainly by the end. Um, but yeah, it's plenty of stories to tell. I don't want to give too much away because uh, people will be able to watch that on our YouTube channel later in the week. But uh, yeah, certainly a, a good sort of half hour chat about various things. But of course, that Barcelona game as well with the anniversary being on Thursday and I think, yeah, it's such a, an incredible night, an incredible week, actually, of course, with Vincent Company's goal, I think, for Manchester City against Leicester was, was earlier that week. Then what happened with Liverpool and, and what happened in the other Champions League semi final as well. So it was a, a bizarre week, a, a fantastic feast of football. And, and hopefully, fingers crossed, we can uh, get back to that sooner rather than later. And just a, a final point on European adventures and whatnot, Dolly, but certainly during the last 15 years, that. Champions League win in 2005, obviously Rafael Benitez's first piece of major silverware. And for Jurgen Klopp, the same with the Champions League. It's not often that clubs conquer Europe before doing so domestically. No, I mean, I mean Benitez, it was exceptionally odd. I mean, at least Klopp could say, well, he got to a Europa League final, League Cup final, and he's already got, and he got to another Champions League final. So there was kind of a development to that, a curve to it, but. What Benitez did was just, it was just, that's why everybody, it, that's okay. It isn't just the fact that Liverpool won the Champions League and won it by coming from 3 0 down. It's everything that went up to that. They had the Olympiacos game. Almost every single game that they played in that run, I think when we did the podcast a couple of weeks ago, you felt at the end of the first leg, oh, Liverpool have done really well, but oh, they might they might get knocked out. You know, they conceded the late away, a late away goal to Bay Leverkusen, same to Juventus in the quarterfinals, failed to score an away goal at Chelsea in the semi final. So, they just seem to forever be overcoming the odds. And for all, you know, the 2019 was great. Istanbul is still probably the best one in that sense. But you're right, say it is, it is, there can't be any other clubs. They, I don't think there are any other clubs where they've had managers come in and the first trophy they win is the Champions League. You might look at Real Madrid, but even then, I'd imagine that most of them have won the, the Spanish League or the Spanish Cup in that season. I think Zidane might have won about 15, didn't he? Before he went into that. <laughs> No, certainly. Well, that is as good a place as any to, to wrap things up then. This edition of the Blood Red podcast, as we say this week, plenty coming up through the course of the week. And Thursday being that big day to celebrate the 4-0 win over Barcelona. Dan, Ian and Matt, thanks a lot to you guys for joining me here on this edition of the Blood Red podcast. And to you two as well, listening in. And as I say, thank you for your time and your company. But until next time, bye for now.